doubt. You'll be glad, madam, to hear of an act of Monsieur de Dalmont, which it seems to me is in strong contrast to the way he's been represented to you. It's so painful to think disadvantageously of anyone. Here I am doing you a favor by giving you reasons for reversing too harsh a judgment. This morning, Monsieur de Valmont went on one of those walks which might lead one to suspect some intrigue on his part in the neighborhood. Fortunately for us all, one of my men's servants happened to be going the same way, and he related to us that Monsieur de Valmont found in the village a poor family whose goods were being sold because they could not pay their taxes. Monsieur de Valmont not only hastened to discharge their debt, but even gave them a considerable sum of money. Moreover, my servant tells me that Valmont's man had made inquiries about inhabitants of the village that might be in need of help. If this is true, it is not merely a spur-of-the-moment fit of compassion. It is a preconceived plan of doing good, the mere relation of which moved me to tears. When I spoke to him about this action, he seemed to set so little value upon it that his modesty doubled its merit. And now, my respectable friend, tell me if Monsieur de Valmont is indeed an abandoned libertine. Would God permit a virtuous family to receive from a wicked man's hand that aid for which it thanked his divine providence? No. I prefer to believe that his faults, though long continued, are not eternal. And I cannot think that he who does good is the enemy of virtue. I began to tell you in my earlier letter about the good use I made of my inquisitive little shadow, but dinner was served, and if I had finished writing it all down after dinner, it would have been too late to send it. I left off at the almost religious devotion towards me from the poor family. Do you know, seeing their gratitude, my eyes filled with tears? I was astonished at the pleasure there is in doing good, and I should be tempted to believe that those whom we call virtuous people are not so virtuous as they tell us. I ask these good people to pray to God for the success of my plans, and you will see that their prayers have already been partly recompensed. For, here is the point of the whole story, I have made a step forward, a large step. I have at last declared my love, and I obtained perhaps the most flattering reply possible. <laughs> When I returned to the chateau, my fair one's glances, softer than usual, allowed me to guess that the servant had already given an account of his mission, and when she related my adventure to the room, it was as if she were preaching the panegyric of a saint, to see her so moved by a sort of love. After dinner, the ladies wished us all to visit the family I had so piously aided. I spare you the, the boredom of the second scene of gratitude and praise. But when we arrived at the chateau, and Madame de Rosemonde had left the two of us alone together in a dimly lit drawing room, my fair lady asked me, when a person is so worthy of doing good, how can he pass his life doing ill? I, I told her that she would find the key to my conduct in a character which was too compliant. Surrounded by the immoral, I have imitated their vices. Now, seduced by examples of virtues, I have at least tried to follow you. If only you knew the real motive of my actions today. I was now at her knees. In truth, I sought only a means of pleasing. I was the weak agent of the divinity I adore. I clasped her hands in mine, but... She suddenly snatched them away and pressed them over her eyes in despair. Ah, unhappy woman, she exclaimed and, and burst into tears. Uh, fortunately, I had worked myself up to such an extent that I was weeping too. I was so little master of myself that despite my plans for a drawn-out campaign, I was tempted to profit by this moment. A chance came to the aid of my prudence. We heard a noise. Someone was coming in. Madame de Torvel rose in terror and left. As soon as I was certain that it was only her servant, I followed her. I heard her increase her pace and nearly slam her apartment door behind her. 
When I looked through the keyhole, I saw this adorable woman on her knees, bathed in tears and praying fervently. Did I not tell you that her reply to my confession was the most flattering I could hope for? I hoped to see her again at supper, but she left a message that she felt unwell and had gone to bed. I wrote her a long letter to complain of this harshness. The morning I attempted to give it to the feigned invalid, but she refused to take it. I simply left it on her bed. She had to hastily conceal it to avoid a scandal. She handed me her reply this evening just before she went to bed. Notice with what obvious falsity she asserts she is not in love. Oh, for pity's sake, Madame, deign to calm my troubled soul. Placed between an excess of happiness or of misfortune, uncertainty is a cruel torture. Why did I speak to you? Why, at last, in seeing your joy and acts of charity, was I too weak to continue concealing from you the feelings that you yourself have created in me? When I came to Madame de Rosemont's house, I was very far from foreseeing the fate which awaited me. You yourself saw that it was only my aunt's entreaties that kept me here. Then your heavenly soul seduced mine. And without hoping to possess you, I pondered on the means to deserve you. And yet I was happy to adore you in silence. And that source of happiness has become a source of despair since I saw your tears flow, since I heard that cruel, ah, unhappy woman. Why did I have to succumb to my love? Do not suppose that I will insult you by hoping you will return my feelings. But if your heart were made for love, you would not have refused a word of consolation to a wretch who has confessed to you his sufferings. Who have you ever aided who needed it as much as I? Do not abandon me in the delirium into which you plunge me. I do not wish to deceive you. You will not succeed in extinguishing my love, but you will teach me to control it by guiding my steps, by dictating my speech. You will at least save me from the misfortune of displeasing you. You will never grant me all that I want, but I ask for what I need. Will you refuse it? How kind you are, madame. How well you realize it would be easier for me to write than to speak to you. I need so much both you and your advice. I know very well I ought not write to the Chevalier Danceny, but I don't know if I can prevent myself. He keeps on writing to me and tells me I am heartless for not answering, and it grieves me that he is sad, and so I don't know what to do or what will become of me. Tell me, madame, I beg you, would it be very wrong to answer him from time to time? To tell you the truth, I'd rather be unhappy all my life than that he should not have written to me. And while I'm about it, can I ask you another question? I have been told it is wrong to love anybody, but why is that? The Chevalier Danceny says it is not wrong at all, that almost everybody loves. If that is true, I do not see why I should be the only one not to. Or is it only wrong for girls? Mama still treats me like a child. She tells me nothing. When she took me out of the convent, I thought it was to marry me, but now I don't think so. You, who are her friend, perhaps know about it. And if you know, I hope you will tell me. I rely on your friendship.